Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here tonight. We appreciate you coming out for our midweek Bible study. Hopefully it gives us a little bit of break from our day-to-day -day activities where just for a few minutes, again, we can focus on God's Word. So we're grateful that we have the opportunity to do that. Uh, on our uh, continuing prayer list, I have a couple of updates. Uh, Fanny Henson, who... Uh, Leona, that's it. And I've been having a lot of that lately. Last night I was trying to tell Janice something like, you know, you know, and she said, some of us, yeah, him. Oh, man, I tell you. Leona's sister, you know, she's having some test run. Sounds like I need to have some test run. She's having uh, some test run for some, some pain and various issues she's having. So, of course, she's been on our prayer list for quite some time, and she's having she has a lot of trouble with dizziness and those kind of things. But uh, she has been having a lot of tests run, so let's pray for her that she gets good results and they can figure out uh, some way to help her. Uh, Jacqueline, bless her heart, she's she's doing worse. Uh, she told me today that she's just in so much pain, and it it's even worse. And, uh, so she's, uh, Keisha says she's got to go back to the doctor Wednesday, so a week from today, uh, and see what they can do. But uh, putting those boxes in, hoping that was going to work, and maybe it will still work, but at the moment it doesn't seem to be doing too good. She's still in a lot of pain. But uh, she wanted, she told me, and she told Keisha to tell me to tell you how much she loves everybody and she misses everybody, and she said it's just, killing her that she can't come to church and appreciate her dedication with that and she wanted to thank each and every one of you for uh, helping with the groceries and the things that you've done for her and all the prayers for her and she's just so appreciative and so thankful for that and she doesn't like to ask for help but I made her promise to, to ask anytime she needed something we would try to get her whatever she needed so she said she would but uh, she wants everybody to know how much she appreciates uh, what we've done for her and that's what we should do. We're Christ-like and we're supposed to love each other, so uh, that's a good thing. So please pray for her that somehow these boxes will kick in and they'll start working and, and she can get some kind of relief. Uh, and then somebody new, Alvin uh, Shoemaker, who attends Athens Congregation, uh, has diabetes. And so he's, I believe, Maurice, you said tomorrow. Is that correct? Scheduled to have surgery tomorrow to have one of his feet amputated. Uh, so anyway, his name is Alvin Shoemaker. We'll, we'll put him up there, but he, he attends over at Athens. So please pray for him that that, that goes well uh, in that case. Uh, I believe that's all that I have. So uh, we're going to turn the songs over. So over to Brother Cheryl, we'll sing a song. And then Cheryl, you do have the opening prayer tonight. Um, and then Bobby was supposed to have the closing prayer, but Bobby's not here, so... Uh, Lane, can you do that for us? <coughs> All right. Do anybody know where Bobby is? Not a, not like him not to be here. I just missed him a minute ago. You did what? I just missed him myself. Yeah, so I, I, we'll try to check on him. Hopefully it's, uh, something's not wrong. So, Brother Cheryl. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Let me get you a song on Book of Time, number 23. Savior, children away 
Please put your mark at number 21. Take a song of invitation out to the rest. If you would be turning to Revelation chapter 20, we're going to try to finish up chapter 20 tonight. And I meant to say while I was up there, if you all don't mind, just stick around when services are over tonight. I just want to give you all a brief update, some things that we talked about the other night and what we got going. The other night we had a two-hour meeting. It won't be more than an hour and a half tonight, okay? Should be five or ten minutes, maybe, if I could shut up. But anyway, just I, I just wanted to update you on some things and let you know what's going on. So if you don't mind, we'll do that tonight real quick. All right, so we are in chapter 20, and again, so last week we, we covered most uh, of this chapter, and so we talked about the, the four different heavens and what they were and what was going to happen to them, again, because in this chapter, in the chapters 21 and 22, we're really looking at the end of the world. That's things that are not only future tense from John's point of view, but also from ours, okay? And so that's what we're kind of looking at. So let's read these last five verses again from chapter 20 and that's what we want to focus on tonight and uh, pick out a few things from these uh, verses 11 through 15 and i saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them and i saw the dead small and great stand before god and the books were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So we noticed last week, again, a key tenet of the doctrine of premillennialism is that Jesus is going to come back, he's going to return to the earth, and he's going to reign on a literal throne, the throne of David, in the literal city of Jerusalem for a literal thousand years. And so once again, we see there in verse 11, there's one problem with this. Then I saw a great white throne, him that sat on it, whose faith the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. So this verse, among a whole lot of other ones, what do we see? What's going to happen at the end? Destruction. Yeah, the earth is going to be burned up and destroyed. It's not going to be here. 
So how can Jesus reign on a literal throne in a literal city of Jerusalem for a literal thousand years when the earth is going to be destroyed? It, it just doesn't add up and it doesn't make sense. Okay, so again, that language about the fact, it's a figurative a figure of speech, okay? Uh, it's kind of hard to do that literally when the earth is not going to be here anymore. Well, let's look at this idea. He talks about the dead standing before God. This, of course, is the day of judgment. It says the books were opened. Okay, so we want to focus on that for a second. What does it mean, books? And that's plural. So there's more than one, and then, we're, then it's going to talk about the book of life. But before that, it says the books were opened. What could that refer to? Well, in all likelihood, what this is talking about, again, if you read the whole Bible from Genesis through Revelation, you understand the whole narrative of, of mankind and God's plan, we can see that there have been and will only be three spiritual ages since Adam and Eve and up until whenever Jesus returns. There have been, and there will only be three, yeah, there won't be a fourth one. There will only be three of these, okay? And so the first age uh, is known as the patriarchal age. And okay? that was in the beginning. That's where God spoke directly to the patriarchs or the heads of the families, okay? And they had standards that God set for them the way that they were supposed to live. Things that they could do, things they were not supposed to do. And so those people, they are going to be judged according to God's law at that time. It's not the same one that we're under, but they were under a different system. And so those people, that, that will be that book, and they will be judged according to the standards that God had in the patriarchal age, okay? And then, after this, we have the Mosaic Age, okay? And so, what are they under here? The Law of Moses, okay? The Mosaic, the Law the Age of Moses, right? So, this is Mount Sinai, where they get the Ten Commandments, and you see a lot of this in the book of Exodus and Leviticus. And so, Moses is given uh, the law at Mount Sinai, and so... Those people that live during that age, they will be judged according to the law of Moses, which is really the law of God, but it mean it was delivered to the Israelites by Moses, who got them from God, okay? So that's why it's called the law of Moses, but you know, it's really the law of God. But so those people would be judged by that standard. So that, that's a different book, okay? And then finally, you have the third spiritual age, which is what? Yeah, the, what we call the Christian age, okay? And so this is when, again, Jesus is nailed to the cross, and along with him, what else was nailed to the cross? The law of Moses, right? It was nailed to the cross. In other words, it was ended. And remember, Jesus said, I came not to destroy the law, but to do what? Fulfill, fulfill it, right? I came to fulfill, in other words, to end it. It is complete. It has served its purpose. God always extended that or, or expected that to be for a certain period of time. And that came to an end when Jesus was nailed on the cross. And that began the Christian age. So everybody since then, including us, we will be judged by the gospel of Christ. Okay? And so people will say, well, you know, Moses wasn't baptized and Noah wasn't baptized and Abraham wasn't baptized. And no, they weren't. Is that a problem? No. Some people, well, how can they be saved? Because they're going to be judged under the law of their day. We have to be baptized. They didn't. We're not going to be, if you go through Leviticus and you look at all the animal sacrifices, well, you've got to offer a bullock and then you've got to offer this, a goat and all these kind of things. And you've got to do it on certain days. And we don't have to do any of that. Okay. I haven't been sacrificing a lot of animals lately. I'm sure you haven't either. And I'm not going to be judged by that. That's in a different book. Right? So, but what we're going to be judged by is the gospel of Christ in the New Testament. 
So you have these three ages, patriarchal, uh, mosaic, and Christian. I think that's what we're referring to is each book talks about, okay, this was the standard that these people lived under. That's what they're going to be judged by. Okay, so you and I are going to be judged by uh, the gospel of Christ. And so then it talks about the book of life. So you have these other books, these plural books. The books were opened there in verse 12. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their work. So again, they're going to be judged on their time period and what the law of God was then. But we want to notice this book of life that is mentioned quite a few times in the scriptures. Let's go back to uh, the book of Exodus. And we want to see one of the first mentions here of the book of life. If you'll turn to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. Let's notice verses 32 and 33. Exodus 32, beginning in verse 32. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, block me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Okay, this is Moses talking to God, and the Israelites have fallen short, and they've committed these heinous sins. And, and so Moses is trying to intercede uh, for them on their behalf to God and saying, you know, I want you to have mercy on them, otherwise I don't need to be in the book of life either. So he's talking about it. And the Lord said unto Moses, in verse 33, Whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. He's talking about the book of life. Now, let's go back to the New Testament. Turn over to uh, Philippians. Let's look at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, and let's notice verse 3. Philippians 4, verse 3. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Okay? So we see right here who's in the book of life. God told us in Exodus who's not in it. Here we see who is in it. So what's the difference? Workers. Okay, workers for who? Yourself. Yeah, people that are faithful to God, right? So God said those who sin against me, they're going to be blotted out of the book of life. And we see in Philippians there, those that are working, those that are laboring in the kingdom, those who are faithful to God, they will be added to the book. Okay? And so we go, go back to Revelation again, and so we see this mention of the book of life. And they're judged, so they're judged out of those things were written in the books, those books under the different standards again, according to their works, okay? So those that are saved, when you get to the day of judgment, those that are saved, their names will be in the book of life. If your name is not in the book of life on the day of judgment, what does that mean? If you are lost, you're not going to heaven. You're going to eternal torment. That's what that means. We want our names written in the book of life. Okay? That, that's where we want to be. And so God said, if you're not in it, okay, look, look at verse 15 in that last verse. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Okay, So the book of life contains the saved and the wicked who are not saved. They're not going to be in it. Okay? Um, now, we see something else here that everybody's going to be judged, uh, going again back to verse 12, they're going to be judged out of those things that are written in the books according to their works. And then in verse 13, and they were judged every man according to their works. Okay, now this is just a couple of verses among many. Let's turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want you to notice something here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Let's look at uh, verses 10 and 11. 
It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. Okay, so we see here who is going to be before God the Father, before Christ on the day of judgment. Who's going to be there? Everybody. You, me, everybody that's ever lived, everybody that's living now. If the world continues, everybody that lives in the future, everybody will be there Nobody will escape the judgment. Nobody is going to miss that appointment. Okay? We might miss a doctor's appointment or something. We're not going to miss this one. Okay? And so everybody's going to be there, and everybody's going to be judged. And notice again, it says here, you're going to receive the things done in your body according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. Okay? And then going back to Revelation, we saw a couple of verses there. We're going to be judged according to our works, okay? So, and there are other verses that we could look at, and, and we'll look up uh, here in James here in just a second. Uh, what doctrine does that refute that's very popular in the world? Once saved, always saved. And all you got to do is believe. Faith only, Right? All you got to do is believe. If you believe in God, then you're going to be saved. Works don't matter. That's a real popular doctrine, and I guess it would be. Oh, I don't have to do anything sweet. I can live my life however I want to. As long as I believe in God, I'm covered. Yeah, that's, that's pretty comforting. But is that what the Bible teaches? No. It's not what the Bible teaches. Right? Now, we want to emphasize, as we often have, can we earn our way into heaven? No. No. I, I cannot do enough works to repay God for the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. There, there's not enough good works that I can do where I can say on the day of judgment, you know, Lord, you owe me entrance into heaven. Yeah, good luck with that. So I can't do enough. It's, again, we've said like if, if I had to sacrifice my son on the cross, and he's up there and he's got these nails in him and he's bleeding and he dies. Would there be anything that any of you could do to repay me for that sacrifice? I can assure you, you can't. Nothing would make up for the loss of my son. Not like that. Okay. Well, no, there's nothing I can do to make up to God what he's done for me. Right. But what this is saying is God expects us to do good works. We are commanded to do good works. Okay? And if I do those good works, I haven't earned my way into heaven, but what will I get? I will get God's grace, which I have to have. Can't be saved without it, because again, I can't earn it, right? But God's going to look at me on the day of judgment and say, you know what, Mark, you did. You really tried hard to do everything I told you to do. It's still not good enough but God, through his grace, he's going to say, you know what? Come on in. You, you tried to do what I asked you to do. You didn't rebel against me. You didn't spit in my face. You didn't live your life the way you wanted to live. You tried to be as righteous as you could be, and I'm going to let you in. That's the grace of God. We have to have it. Okay? But if I'm not willing to do any of these works, God is not going to bestow his grace upon me. I'm not going to get it. That's the thing. Okay? And that's what the Bible teaches and so this idea that, well, if I just believe that, that should cover everything. That is not scriptural. It's not what the Bible teaches. Let's look at another key passage. Turn over to uh, the book of James. Let's look at chapter 2 in the book of James. And you see this really explained really well here. James chapter 2, let's begin looking in... Verse, uh, let's see, let's start in verse 17. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Now notice this in verse 19. 
Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So tell me, are the devils, are they going to be saved? No. But don't they believe in God? Yeah, they've been in God's presence. Right? They've seen a whole lot more than you and I have seen, and yet it's not going to save them because they've rebelled against God. So, oh, they've got faith. In fact, they know God exists, but that's not going to save them. So this idea, well, if I just believe in God, it doesn't matter what I do, that verse alone would destroy that, or it should, for any open-minded, honest person. Well, let's keep reading. Verse 20. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Your faith is not going to do you one bit of good if you don't do the works that God's told you to do. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Not just because he had faith, but because he did works too. They go together. Verse 24, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. The only verse in the Bible where the words faith and only appear together. Not by faith only. I don't know how you misunderstand that. It's just people don't want to see it. Right? Only time you see those words together and it's not by faith only. Keep reading verse 25. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Okay? And then going back to Revelation, yeah, we will be judged by our works. And if we have done the works of God, then God's grace will kick in and he will let us in, even though we didn't earn it. But remember, God knows we're not perfect. He know, He's not stupid. He knows that. right? He knows I'm never going to be perfect, no matter how hard I try. But if I'm trying my best to live like he wants me to live, and then if I do mess up, I repent and I fix it, his grace is going to allow me to go to heaven because I did the best I could. That's what God expects. He doesn't expect us to be perfect, but he wants us to earnestly strive to please him through our works. Okay? So it, again, it, this, it really can't be any plainer. We are going to be judged by what we do in our bodies, whether it be good or whether it be bad. That's what determines whether you and I get into the book of life or we don't. That's what will determine it. And if we get in the book of life, all those people in the book of life, Everyone that's in there, did they earn it? No. But what they're going to get is the grace of God because they strive to do the best they could. And God's going to give them his grace. Okay, so there's really no, for anybody with an open mind, it's really, I just want to know the truth and we can see it right here. Uh, that's what it says. Now, I want us to notice something else in here. Um, Notice this in verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. That's kind of an interesting. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. What do you think that's talking about? We kind of talked about that last week. Remember, every time you see that word hell translate, it's different Greek words. Yeah, Hades is the eternal place of torment. Is that what they're talking about here? Hell, hell gave up the... No. Hades, right? Because we said when everybody dies, where they go? You go to paradise, like Lazarus, or you go to torment with a rich man, and there's a gulf between them. That's the Hadean realm, right? So, yeah, on the day of judgment, we said those first three heavens, they're going to cease to exist, and that's one of them. And it's, they're going to give up the dead. They're going to give up the people that are there and all those people that have died. And when it says the sea gave up the dead, which were in it, 
everybody that's dead and obviously also the people that are alive at that time when Jesus returns, they're all going to be before the judgment seat of God. Everybody. Okay? And so that, that's what that's telling us right here. So what we're seeing again in this chapter, we noticed it when we first started looking at this chapter, this is giving us really the account uh, for the most part of what's going to happen to the wicked. Okay, those people that are not in the book of life, those people that have not lived their life according uh, to the way God wants them to, we're seeing here the judgment for the wicked. And so again, the chapter concludes, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That is the eternal Gehenna, the eternal hell, the place of torment that, that doesn't end. Okay, so they're going to be cast into that and notice right before this, in, in verse 14, death and hell, again, were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. Okay? So we've talked about that. Let's just, let me quiz you. What's the second death? Judgment. Okay, what's, well, make more specific. Final judgment. Final judgment. And does everybody get the second death? No. No. Who does? The wicked. The wicked. Right? What's the first death? Physical. When your body dies, physical death. The second death is eternal separation from God. So what about those people who die on the day of judgment? We're in the book of life and we're faithful. Will we face the second death? No. Because we're going to face second life, right? Eternal life in heaven. The second death, meaning, it, and again, some people read that, well, that means you're going to burn up in 10 seconds and that'll be the end of it. But there's, there's too many scriptures in the Bible that talk about hell as an eternal place. It's the fire that cannot be quenched. Does that sound like it's going to be over in 10 seconds? It can't be quenched. It, it's eternal. So the second death is a spiritual death, and it doesn't mean that, well, your spirits are going to be killed the way we understand death, like, well, you just don't exist anymore. It means you're going to be eternally separated from God. Those people in the book of life, they're going to be eternally dwelling with God. We will have eternal life. What we don't want is the second death. Okay? And so in chapter 20, that's really what the, the mo most of the focus of this chapter is what's going to happen to the wicked on the day of judgment. Now, the good news is what we're going to see next, chapters 21 and 22, it's more focused on what's going to happen to the righteous. What, what about them on the day of judgment? What's heaven going to be like? What, what is the reward for the people that are in the book of life? And so God is going to show John those things too. This is, this is sort of what it's going to look like. He's going to put it in, again, figurative language. It's not to be taken literally, but he's going to describe heaven in terms that John can understand. In earthly terms. But is heaven really going to look like an earthly place? No, because it's going to be a spiritual abode. But, he, but he's going to show John in a way that John, his human brain, can comprehend. Okay? And so Lord willing, that's what we'll start looking at uh, next week uh, in chapter 21. So anybody have any questions or comments? I have a question, but it doesn't have to do with it. What is it? Is Enoch the only man that God put? Enoch? Enoch. Well, I ain't shaking her head. Who's the other one? Elijah. Yeah. So it was two. Mm -hmm. The only two that we know of. Y'all killing me. What is it? <laughs> You'll keep going until you get a question. I don't know. What is it? They went to, they, I would assume, based on, again, all other verses, they went to the Hadean realm. Okay. Yeah. So they went to paradise which is the same place Jesus went to when he was crucified. He went to paradise for three days. He was in the Hadean realm. Then he came back to earth for 40 days, and then he ascended into heaven where God is. Okay? Now, did they ascend straight to that place where God is? It doesn't really specify, but you would think it would be the Hadean realm. But I'll, I'll try to do some more research on that and see what I can figure out. Do what? Go ahead. If they didn't die, no. They were just taken up. They didn't die. They didn't, they didn't die physically. Yeah. Yeah. So 
So they were the only two that we know of that did not experience physical death. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, it looks like they just went on to death. That's well, think, well, that's a good question. Nobody's ever asked me that question before. So, again, my thought would be they probably went to the Hadean realm because it says that's where everybody goes. But if God wanted to make an exception, he could do that because obviously those two men were exceptions to physical death because the rest of us have to go through and they didn't have to go through. I wouldn't mind if God didn't make me go through that. I, you know, that'd be okay with me, but I uh, have to check on that and see what I, what else I can learn. That's a good question. Some, some believe that they'll be the witnesses and they'll have to be murdered first in order to come back and be judged. They'll have to be murdered uh, well, or have to be killed? Martyr, martyr, be oh, martyred, uh -huh. you know, yeah. Uh, I don't think there's any indication of that. They just, you know, God took them up because they were very righteous and they were very pleasing in his sight. And he's allowed to do that. Uh, so, yeah, I don't think there would be any reason that, well, now you've got to go back and experience a physical death before you can... Yeah, right. So, anybody else want to stump me tonight? <laughs> Did Jesus just... Oh, we got another one. <laughs> Well, it doesn't tell us like what he did while he was there for the three days. But again, based on everything else the Bible says about the Hadean realm, again, think about the rich man. There was no hope for him. He had no chance to, and he couldn't even send a message to his brothers back on earth. So now, you know, once you're here, that's it, and it's a done deal. You're has to be made in this life. Right, so... My assumption would be, based on the scriptures, that again, it doesn't tell us specifically what Jesus did those three days while he was there, but my assumption would be the people that were in torment, they're stuck. Mm -hmm. And the people that were there in Abraham's bosom, which is where Jesus was, they're, they're in good shape. So there would be no indication that Jesus at that point gave the others a chance because if you really think about it, would that be fair? That's not fair to you and me because we don't get an extra chance after we die. So, uh, and that's what the rich man was told. Said, you, you had the prophets, you had, you had every chance while you were alive on earth and you did not take advantage of it. Well, now you're reaping what you've sown, right? Does that make sense? So I would not think that Jesus would give anybody over there an extra chance. They're, they're reaping what they've sown. Right, which he is. Right, but they didn't know about Christ at the time. Yeah, or some of, some of them did that were like uh, in the Hadean realm. By that point, they would have, those people that died shortly before Jesus did or shortly after Jesus, they would have known about him. But if they're in torment, that means they chose not to believe or not to, not to obey him. It's your living life that you make your choice in. You make your choice now, right? And so once, once we leave this physical body or once Jesus comes back it's too late our choices have been made at that point and so that's why Jesus says watch and be ready why would he tell us that if, well don't worry after you die I'm going to give you another chance right and, and, and I know some people uh, there are some religious groups who teach that say well hell can be a temporary place and if enough people pray for you and they used to charge people money. Well, if you'll pay money, you can get grandma out of hell. And they taught all that kind of stuff, you know. But that's not scriptural. Like, there's, there's no way out. And the reverse is also true, right? If we get to paradise, ain't no way out of there either. Nor would we want to get out, right? So we can't lose our salvation at that point. The people on the other side, they're not going to be able to gain their salvation. All that happens in the here and now, right? So that's, again, Jesus said, watch and be ready. Because when you when your death comes or when I return, there won't be any more chances. That's it, and all your chances are used up. So you, you got to be watching. You could be on a crew, fixed the bottom of a bridge at two o'clock in the morning. You better be ready. Yeah, because again, Jesus said it'll come like a thief in the night. It's not going to come when you expect it. It's when you least expect. 
So, and that doesn't necessarily mean that, because we would think, oh, it's, that means it's going to be in the middle of the night. And it very well could be. But the idea is it just means when we're not, sudden. we're not, yeah, it's going to be sudden and we're not, you know, I didn't get up this morning thinking, oh, Jesus is going to come back today. Well, what if he does? You know, and he said, you know, a lot of people are going to be caught off guard because it, it's just going to come suddenly and it's not, they're not going to be expecting it. And so you better be ready so that it doesn't take you unawares. Um, but yeah, it could it occur at any time. Do you not think that the uh, uh, statement where, where he talking to the rich, rich man when he asked if he could send somebody back to tell his brother? He, they said no, but he's a liar. He can listen to him if he would. Right. That's a, that's a, that's a big statement. Yeah, because he, again, he's, he's saying like you, you had every opportunity while you were there, but you refused to listen. Well, guess what? Right now, your brothers have that same opportunity. They've got the prophets. They've got the word of God. It's up to them where they're, well, well if somebody would go back from the dead, they'd believe, right? And they, no, they won't. If they haven't believed already with everything else, they, it's like the people I always want Jesus to show. Just, well, show me one more miracle. Well, you've already seen a hundred. That hundred first, that's going to make the difference. When they say, well, if you'll just come down from the cross, we'll believe you. Oh, sure you will. You've already seen him raise the dead. You've seen him heal the blind. And, all, and you still haven't believed that if he walks down from the cross, you're going to find some other reason not to believe. Because those people, their hearts are hardened. Right? And so, yeah, he tells him, look, your brothers, they still have an opportunity just like you did. So it's up to them, though, to listen. But the idea was, even if we send somebody back from the dead, what they've demonstrated so far, that's not going to convince them either. They're not, they're not interested in what God wants them to do. So. Anybody else? Oh, we got another one. <laughs> This is not my fault. We're here all night tonight, okay? It's, for once, it's not me. Okay, by the rich man's sin, uh, the poor man in Lazarus' bosom, are we going to be able to see people we love in, in torment? In torment by that? I don't think so, because, and there's no indication there that the, the poor man could see, or that Lazarus could see the rich man. There's no indication that he could. There's a gulf. Right, and so what we're told about even there in the Hadean realm, it, it's a place of comfort. It's it's a place of paradise, right? And then going to heaven, uh, same thing. There'll be there's no nothing bad there, right? And so yeah, if if I went there and I was in paradise, but if I could see my parents, yeah. If I saw my parents over there burning and suffering, how could I stay happy, right? So that's what, and people, you know, they want to say all the time, and I get it, it's a sentimental, you know, when we lose relatives and we want to, well, she, she's watching down over me right now. Especially not, if, if they're in paradise, if you could look back and see what's going on on earth, that's a lot of sorrow, right? You know, so... I'm convinced that you get in that state, you're, you're not going to be exposed to anything negative. Well, what if you're worried about, so yeah, the rich man, he's worried about his brothers. Now, surely Lazarus probably knew people that, you know, hadn't lived right. Was he worried about them? Probably not, right? Because if he was, he would have been sad. He would have been, oh, I'm worried about my friends too. or my. So I, I would think what that means is you go there uh, maybe when you're in torment, yeah, you can remember the things on earth and the things you didn't do because that's part of the torment. But if we're in paradise, we're not going to remember anything negative. Right? So I'm convinced that, yeah, I won't remember because I, like you all, I have people in my life that have gone on and I know good and well they weren't faithful. I know where they are. And that saddens me. If I, I just, my I try not to think about it, you know, because I can't do anything about it now. So every time I think about it, it breaks my heart. So I'm convinced when I get there, I'm not going to remember any of that because it would hurt me. It would make me sorrowful. 
if I thought, oh, my, my wife's not here, my son's not here, my parents aren't here, my, my sister's not here, the, any of you all, oh, they're not here, you know, my brethren at, at uh, Etowah, some of them didn't make it, that would make me sorrowful. So there's no way, well, how God's going to, God can do anything he wants, right? So he can wipe my memory, and I'm not going to remember anything that's going to make me sorrowful. Everything's going to be awesome. And I'm looking forward to that. And aren't we all, right? Because we all have torments, and we all have uh, sickness and disease and sorrow, and all of us at our age, no offense, <laughs> we've buried a lot of people that we loved and cared about, and it hurts. I'm looking forward to not remembering any of that stuff and, and just being happy all the time and not worried about getting sick or losing anybody ever again or, or grieving over somebody. I, I can do without all that stuff. I'm, so I'm looking forward to not having it. God's not going to let anything hurt me at that point. So, yeah, I, I don't think the Lazarus could, I don't think he could see over there because, again, if you're, if you're really a, a good person, as apparently Lazarus was, if we're really a good person, we're supposed to have love and compassion for our fellow man. And as we said, we're not supposed to want somebody to burn. Right? We, we, oh, I hope that guy gets what he, that, that better not be our attitude. It's easy to have that attitude. But our attitude better be, man, I, I wish that guy would repent because... I don't want him to suffer. I don't. I don't want anybody to suffer torment through eternity. I mean, I, I can't imagine, right? So to see that, even on people that we thought were really bad, it would still, if you have a tender heart, it would tear you apart. You know, there's no way you could look over there and smile and go, oh, "Isn't that great? Look at everybody suffer." I mean, you know, it would be horrible. So I don't think he, that was kind of a one way. They can see over there and see what they're missing. That's part of the torment. But the people in paradise are not going to be able to see the suffering because God said there will be no suffering at that point. So. And there's only a count in the Bible of heaven and hell. I mean, well, of, of the Hedean, yeah, of kind of how it is. Yeah. yeah. So, anyway, we want to make sure we're in the book of life and we're on the right side. And, and let's take as many people with us as we can. Uh, Satan's trying to take as many people. He knows where he's going, and he's trying to take as many people as he can with him. And unfortunately, he's going to take a bunch. Uh, but our goal is let's let's take as many as we can to be with us. So. All right, anybody else? Okay. Now, in all seriousness, I appreciate that. If you guys have questions. And like I said, I, I told y'all, I don't have all the answers. I don't know everything. So if I don't, I will try to do some research and I'll try to find out uh, what I can. So I, I will look into what Elaine uh, asked because that that's a very interesting question. We'll see what we can find out on that. So every day I read the Bible, I'm always learning new things that I didn't know before. And it, it might be a verse I've read a hundred times. And then, you know, oh, I never really noticed that before. So it's a lifelong learning process so uh, i appreciate the comments appreciate the questions and that's how we learn together so all right if you guys would turn in your bibles to luke chapter 12 luke chapter 12 we'll be looking there in just a minute so speaking of what we were just talking about what happens after death well this is a question that man has thought about for ages and ages Will there be anything at all? Is this all there is? Or is it true that we will live on? A lot of people ask that question. And so what you believe about that really dictates the way that you're going to live your life, whether you believe in a life after this one or you don't. It will dictate how you live here. Because if you believe that this is all there is and once you die, you're fin. They pour that, pull that sheet over your head, and that's all there is. There's nothing after that. Well, then you're probably going to try to squeeze as much fun out of this life as you can because it's all there is, right? And we're not saying for a second you should never have fun in this life. Some people have that out. Well, God just wants us to suffer all the time. No, he doesn't. Right? So there's nothing wrong with having some fun as long as it's 
clean fun if you're not doing something that's against God. But, but there's plenty of things we do to have fun. But I'm talking about, you know, if you think that's all there is, you got to go for that gusto and just, you know, live every day to help because, well, uh, once I die, there's not going to be anything else. Well, let's take a look at Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 16. Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Right? And that is the philosophy of a lot of people in life. I want to eat, drink, and be merry. Okay? And again, done in a righteous way, nothing wrong with that. But you know what we're talking about here. I'm just, I'm going to live it up and I'm going to live for today and for right now. I'm not going to worry about anything else. So a lot of people have that philosophy. And so that's, that's how they live their life. Well, you know, we're just going to live here and then we die and, and that's it, game over. And, well, that's what the Sadducees believe which is kind of weird because, you know, they were religious leaders. Like, well, why would you even be religious if there was nothing after this life? But anyway, they were, right? So they believed in God, but they still said, well, there's no resurrection. There's no, you know, when we leave this earth, that's it. That's what they believed. And they, and they thought they had a pretty foolproof argument to kind of prove that. And so they undoubtedly, they used this argument on a lot of people and probably, you know, had some people bone fuzzled, had some positive effects, until they tried it on Jesus. So turn over to Mark chapter 12. We were in Luke 12. Let's look at Mark chapter 12. Because they're going to fail miserably here. Because Jesus is going to destroy their argument and he's going to expose their ignorance of the scriptures. And they claim that they knew all about the scriptures and they were experts and Jesus is going to expose them and say, you really don't know anything at all. You have no idea what you're talking about. So look at Mark chapter 12. Let's begin reading in verse 18. Then come unto him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. And they asked him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, if a man's brother die and leave his wife behind him, and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were seven brethren, and the first took a wife, and dying left no seed. The second took her and died, neither left he any seed, and the third likewise. And the seven had her and left no seed. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, therefore, <coughs> when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to wife. Who's she going to belong to? Right? You believe in the resurrection? Well, how does that work? And Jesus answering said unto them, do you not therefore err? So he's telling them, you don't know what you're talking about. Because you know not the scriptures, neither the power of God. For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. And as touching the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living, yet, there, yet therefore do greatly err. Okay, you guys have no idea what you're talking about. She's not going to belong to anybody in heaven because there will be no man and wife in heaven. It's like the angels, the angels don't marry. That's not the way things work in heaven. That, that's an earthly thing, and it goes back to the Garden of Eden where God said, be fruitful and multiply, right? So you don't need that in heaven. Jesus said, you don't have a clue what you're talking about. So you think you can trap me with this or trick me, just trying to prove there is no resurrection because how in the world would you figure out who she's supposed to be married to? Well, she's not going to be married to anybody. That's the way things work there. And notice where he says, he talks about, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He's, the God is, he's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. Well, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at this point, they've been dead for a long time, physically speaking. But were they still alive? 
Of course they were. Their spirits were still alive. That's what Jesus was saying. Yes, there is a resurrection. Yes, your spirit will live on. This life on earth, that ain't all there is. This is just, it's not even 1% of your existence. Point zero zero, a thousand zeros, you know, right? It, this is minuscule compared to our life in eternity. So Jesus, God is the God of the living, not of the dead. Okay? So everybody's going to live on somewhere, and that's what Jesus is telling him. So the Sadducees, they denied the afterlife, not because there wasn't plenty of evidence for it, because there was, but they just, they simply didn't want to believe in it. Probably because they didn't want to believe in hell. I don't, I don't want to think that I might go to hell, so if I just cut it all out, that'd be better than going to hell if I just ceased to exist. So, you know, it, that gave them some comfort, I guess. But Jesus demonstrates here how wrong they were, and it's a pretty big thing to be wrong about when you think about it. So imagine just living your life thinking this is all there is and then only to die and find out, boy, did you back the wrong horse. All right, there's a whole lot more to it, much more, an eternity more. That will be a hard realization for some. And so many people spend their lives chasing the dream, right, the, the, the dream of humanism and accumulating all the toys. I remember years ago I, I saw a poster, and it, it showed on the poster there was a mansion and there was a Lamborghini and there was a helicopter and a Learjet and a swimming pool and all this kind of stuff. And, and the words on the poster said, he who dies with the most toys wins. Actually, the opposite is true, probably. If you die with the most toys, that means you've dedicated your life to that and you've missed the whole point. Right? But that's the idea of eat, drink, and be merry. I'm just going to live it up right here and I'm not going to worry about the afterlife because I don't believe in it. Well, again, that's going to be a hard thing to discover, that you've lived your whole life on earth and you missed the whole point. And that is that God wants us to live not a selfish life, but a selfless life. He, he wants to prepare us for something infinitely better, like we were just talking about a few minutes ago, a place with no sorrow, no suffering, no death, no pain, None of those things. No disease. He's preparing us for something infinitely better than a life here on earth of passing fancies and, you know, self-centered focus. He's preparing us for eternity with him. And Jesus said, oh, it, it most definitely is there. And so not believing that condemns us to an eternity of torment. So believing that there is a life after death completely changes the way that we live here, the way we live our lives on earth. And we need to dedicate our lives in service to God rather than in serving ourselves. So tonight, if you're not a Christian, you need to change your focus from serving yourself to serving God. Because if you don't do that, you will not be in the book of life that we talked about earlier in class. If you need to be baptized into Christ tonight, we have everything prepared. We can do that for you. And you can dedicate your life to God rather than to yourself. If, on the other hand, if you've been a Christian, but you've gone back into the world, that means you're no longer in the book of life. And you will be judged according to those works that you're doing, which maybe right now are not good works. Well, if that describes you, and I don't know if it does, but if it does, you need to come back. You need to confess those sins, repent for them, pray to God for forgiveness, and he's promised that he'll forgive you for those things that you repent of. So if you have a need tonight, please come forward as together we stand and we sing. Oh, most persuaded, how to believe, oh, most
Stick around for just a few minutes. I'm going to update you on some things as soon as we finish up here. Let me find Brother Mark again tonight. I always feel good. He does an excellent job on He's, He does really good. We need to be thankful. We all need to be really thankful. Praise everyone. Remember, those on our prior list, uh, a lot of not that we all know, not on our prior list, let's pray for all of all the sick. Please remember, services, Sunday morning, Bible study at 9.30, paper service at 10.30, Sunday night at 6 o'clock, and back again here next Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. We all need to be here. We all need to try to bring somebody with us. Please turn your song book to number 46. Let's sign the first verse of this one out of the book. Let's leave the time that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred mind is like to that.